who um, I, I set up the, the ataxia clinic in 1994, and the idea was to try and achieve a diagnosis in all progressive ataxias. Uh, studied the natural history of different ataxias by reviewing patients on a regular basis, offer support and regular follow-up, promote research, and also forge collaborations with other ataxia centers, not just in the UK, but also abroad. Um, so we are lucky to be accredited as ataxia center of excellence by ataxia UK, and that came with the, some financial support for a ataxia nurse. Uh, for the first three years, uh, but um, that went very well and we were successful in then securing the funding from the NHS for that nurse, and in fact we just appointed another ataxia nurse and another consultant uh, neurologist with an interest in ataxia. Um, we are interested in all ataxias, and in fact I'm very interested in idiopathic sporadic ataxias because that's, I think, what is um, required a lot of work to reach a diagnosis. Um, and um, most of the patients who get referred to, to our center will not have a diagnosis, and hence the reason for why they are being referred. We are interested in immune-mediated ataxias and things like gluten ataxia and primary autoimmune cerebellar ataxia, and we have done quite a bit of research in that field. Um, so how, how does it work? Well, we get patients referred from all over the UK and abroad. Um, they have their initial assessment with me. Uh, they get to see the ataxia nurse. Uh, they uh, have the initial uh, tests and scans and so forth. Uh, and then they um, get, had a follow-up uh, uh, either six uh, months or 12 months later, or even earlier if they want to. Uh, we have a good access to genetic testing. Our own lab has uh, a good um, setup. Uh, but we also collaborate with a lot of the labs uh, elsewhere. And uh, the patients have a regular consultant review, uh, particularly for those patients where there's no diagnosis yet. Um, I mentioned uh, the imaging that we do. Um, uh, and thanks to Ataxia UK, we had a grant many years ago to look at spectroscopy in patients with ataxia, and that led to us using this technique now on a regular basis. So any patient who has a scan in Sheffield will have MR spectroscopy. So what's MR spectroscopy? You um, put a little square in the area of interest. Obviously, here is a cerebellum, and you get this spectra. And there are three important spectra. There's the choline, creatine, and N-acetyl aspartate. Um, the ratio of this peak peak to creatine gives you an idea of how well the, metabolic, the, the, the metabolism of the cells is. So why is that important? Because you might have a cerebellum that's completely shrunken, but the cells there are functioning reasonably well. Or you may have a cerebellum that is of normal size, it looks normal on the scan, but when you do the spectroscopy, it's very impaired, and that means that things are not working very well. So why is it important? Because if you have an intervention that might help, a treatment, then you can demonstrate that this NAA um, goes up. So it's a, a, a way of monitoring progress. So this, here's an example of a patient with gluten ataxia. Uh, a year after going on to a gluten-free diet, you see that the NAA peak has gone up, and it looks much more normal now. So that's a very useful tool, which we are gaining more and more experience with. So what's my role in the clinic? Um, I think with all this um, genetic uh, um, revolution, if you like, we shouldn't really forget the importance of the clinical skills um, in, in, in diagnosing the ataxias. Uh, so the new generation sequence is not the answer to all diagnoses. We still have to use our clinical judgment to, uh, uh, because we, you know, we, we don't have uh, every uh, thousands of pounds to spend on each patient. We have to rationalize how we use our services. So the importance of clinical observation means that we can identify new entities, such as what we term primary autoimmune cerebellar ataxia, and also gain experience in the natural history of ataxia. So if somebody doesn't have a diagnosis, uh, so it has idiopathic sporadic ataxia, 
you can, by seeing these patients again and again and again, and although it's a heterogeneous group, you can still formulate some idea about prognosis. What, what about the role of the ataxia NS? Well, the NSs address practical aspects, uh, home issues at work, access to support, physiotherapy, OT, speech and language therapy. They are available at the end of the phone, so between appointments, if you, the patient remembered something and they wanted to ring and clarify something or have a problem, uh, that works very well. And often we get phone calls from a patient of ours who might have been admitted in another hospital with a specific problem and the doctors there don't know how to, whether it's related to ataxia or not or what to do, and sometimes we transfer patients to our hospital. They are able to spend much more time in discussing the implications of ataxia. They, we work very closely. We run our clinics in parallel. Uh, and uh, for some patients where we have a diagnosis, uh, they can help with the follow-up. So if the things are stable, we know what we need to look for, then the ataxia NS may see the patient alternate with me, for example. The other thing that's quite important is motivating patients to help themselves. So, as you probably, you'll see later, alcohol-induced attacks is one of the commonest causes of sporadic attacks in the UK. So um, uh, one of Anessis has done a motivational therapy course, which allows here to uh, motivate patients, make them aware of the fact that the alcohol might be playing a part and how to stop drinking. And similarly, for patients with gluten ataxia, motivating them to stick to a gluten-free diet, which is not that easy. And often we also run some more specialist clinics uh, with input from other specialist nurses like the cerebellar variant of MSA uh, group of patients that we have. So let's look at the causes of uh, ataxia. So um, we, um, we've now got about uh, 1,288 to be precise patients. It's probably gone up a bit since last week. Uh, I calculated uh, by the fact that when I wrote the abstract in November, uh, to now the numbers have gone up, that I see 10 new patients per month. Uh, of those, 20% have a family history and 80% don't. So if we look now at those patients who don't have a family history, there is a sizable number, in fact the biggest number, 25%, that um, we don't have a cause. So those are the ones we need to think hard and keep thinking about what the cause is. In our center, one of the commonest causes of ataxia is gluten ataxia. So this is uh, an autoimmune ataxia triggered by eating gluten. So it's a bit like celiac disease, but the manifestation is with the, uh, with the brain rather than the gut. Uh, and that accounts for 23% of, of, of cases. Alcohol-related follows, 14%. A genetic cause, meaning that if we do genetic tests, even in this group of patients, we can still find a genetic cause in 13%, which is quite a sizable number. Then is MSAC, which is a, a degenerative form of ataxia, which is unfortunately very progressive and very disabling, 12%. And then there's a lot of much less common ones, like ataxia that is associated with cancer, anti ataxia, and so forth. Very, very uh, small numbers there. I know from what Sue said that uh, my figures about gluten ataxia seem to um, uh, impress some people and they didn't know that um, uh, gluten ataxia can be so common. Of course, there's a bit of bias in the sense that we have an interest, so we often get referred patients with this condition. But I just want to share with you this new information, and this is a study we did uh, with funding from Celiac UK. So we looked at 100 patients, newly diagnosed celiac disease, and we did scans on their head with spectroscopy. 44% had abnormal spectroscopy of the cerebellum, uh, as opposed to 3% in controls. And when you examine those patients, 56% with abnormal had clinical evidence of balance problems. What that tells us is that this process of gluten ataxia starts early on, and of course, if you are lucky enough to have been diagnosed because you had bowel symptoms, then you'll do well because you go on the diet. But if not, you might present with ataxia much later on and be very disabled by it. So what about examination clues? So you heard in the previous talk that we have this 
sort of uh, dart board and we throw things at it. But sometimes, you know, you can pick up clues that allow you to make a diagnosis. So here's a patient who um, had problems for a very, very young age, uh, came to see me at the age of 35 plus, and, uh, and basically, it, it looked like an early onset ataxia, uh, very disabled by it. And on examination, what I noticed was that he had these uh, lumps on his tendons. So this is a condition called cerebrodendinous xanthomatosis. Uh, and based just on this observation, we made the diagnosis. And the sad thing is that this condition is treatable. And had this patient been on, a, on, on a tablets from a young age, would have done very well but now is very, very disabled. So this is a lady who developed ataxia over the age of 60, came to the clinic. I noticed that she had these telangiectatic changes. And now is the wrong age for ataxia telangiectasia, uh, which presents in childhood. But a test, a, a blood test called alpha fetoprotein was borderline up. So then I spoke to my colleague, um, Malcolm Taylor in Birmingham, who does all the genetics for this condition, sent blood sample, and indeed she had ataxia telangiectasia, one of the older patients that we've ever seen with this condition. And then just another example of somebody coming in with an itchy skin rash who uh, is uh, proved to be something called dermatitis hepatiformis, which is a, a gluten-related problem. So this patient had gluten ataxia. So going back to the genetic causes now, again in sporadic ataxia, as you recall that we said that 13% uh, we found them to have a genetic cause. If you look at the common causes of sporadic, well, Friedrich's ataxia is top because of course being recessive means that you don't always have a family history. It's followed by mitochondrial diseases, some scars, uh, common as in the UK, scar six and episodic ataxia. And then there's a lot of other ones, some extremely rare, but uh, we were able to reach a diagnosis. So out of all idiopathic sporadic cases, a genetic cause was found in 34%, which is uh, you know, a sizable number. What about familiar ataxia? As you recall that we said it was 20% of the whole group. 71% uh, had a, an autosomal dominant family history, which is not surprising, and 29% recessive. And the commonest dominant ataxia, as we see, um, are episodic ataxia type 2. Now, it's overtaken spinocerebellar ataxia type 6 as the commonest ones. And then, much less common, SCAR 2, 3, and 7. And then there's a few other ones which are much rarer. In terms of recessive ataxias, which uh, represent 29% of all familiar, familiar ataxias, again, as you might expect, Friedrich's ataxia comes top. So if we um, include uh, all familiar ataxias together, whereas well, a family history, we can achieve a genetic diagnosis in 45% at the moment. We, uh, our genetic labs all, uh, also have uh, introduced the next generation sequencing. So this is the panel test where you put a lot of genes and you can test for them at one go. So our experience is now with 20 patients uh, uh, so far, 16 of which had a family history and four were early onset. Early onset makes it more likely to be genetic. So we picked up seven positive patients. To our surprise, we have three SCAR14, so that means that maybe SCAR14 is going to prove a common SCAR. Three episodic ataxia type 2s, one RSUX, and one SPG7. And the SPG7 is interesting because, in fact, it's a hereditary spastic paraparesis rather than an ataxia, but these patients have significant ataxia. When we realized that this seemed to become, uh, seemed to be uh, uh, common, we uh, started looking just for that gene in those patients who had ataxia and a mild spasticity in the legs. And just, so this is the old uh, style of testing, you know, you just clinically think, hmm, maybe this, go for that. And we managed to pick up 11 positive patients over a period of less than a year. So this is going to be a very common cause of uh, ataxia. Um, what about the diagnostic yield after assessing uh, patients in our center? 
Well, 48% of uh, a diagnosis was achieved after investigations at our centre. There were 13% of patients where the referral was uh, of a patient who already had a diagnosis, but they wanted to be seen in a more specialised centre. Um, and, and we're left with 39% where no diagnosis uh, has been made as yet, and ongoing investigations have been made. So if you look at the overall diagnostic yield, it was 55%. Now, that looks good because it justifies my existence. But on the other hand, it looks bad as well because uh, it's a bit worrying that uh, neurology colleagues are referring patients uh, of which 55% we can make a diagnosis and they cannot. So it means that the, for those colleagues who don't refer patients to our centers, maybe may a lot of patients who uh, don't have a diagnosis and could potentially have a diagnosis if they were assessed in a, in a, in a center where, with expertise. So just to conclude, so uh, we now, uh, we, alre we already knew that Friedrich's ataxia was the commonest genetic ataxia, but it looks as if episodic ataxia type 2 is overtaking SCA6 as the commonest uh, dominant ataxia. The total number of potentially genetic ataxias, which includes those with a family history, plus all those who are genetically confirmed, is 30%. Uh, we can achieve genetic characterization in familiar ataxias in 45%, and I think that will go up now with all this new genetic testing that's available. That's very interesting because um, we, the three cases I showed you where we picked up episodic ataxia type uh, 2 had no episodes of ataxia. So in other words, although it's called episodic ataxia, you may not have the episodes and therefore never think about testing them for episodic ataxia. And one of those families is a huge family uh, known to uh, the late Anita Harding, and Paula knows about them, and they collect the samples from a massive group of patients, families. And uh, to our surprise, when we tested them, it was episodic ataxia type 2. Uh, it looks as if SPG7 and SK14 are proving to be common causes of progressive ataxia. The commonest causes of sporadic ataxia in the UK are gluten, alcohol, genetic, and uh, multisystem atrophy. The idiopathic sporadic ataxias account for 20% of all ataxias. So we're getting there slowly. Uh, and of course, you have to bear in mind that this group is likely that some of these uh, patients will prove to have a genetic cause. But also, uh, they're likely to have an immune etiology. And, and my colleague Priya uh, Shamukaraja had a poster yesterday showing that a percentage of these patients have antibodies attacking the Purkinje cells. And of course, that's important because it may be that in the future, treatment with immunosuppressive drugs might be beneficial to them. Thank you very much for listening.